So hello everyone and welcome to another of our SAE Game Stories episodes hosted by SAE Athens. Um, this time we're doing it in English and I'm Kostadinos Dimopoulos. I'm the head of games at SAE. With me we have my co-host or main host, I don't know, I'm Akis Ariadis. <laughs> the only host. And, <laughs> <laughs> and with us uh, we have Valentina Chrysostomou who kindly agreed to, to join us. Hi, everybody. It's nice to be here. Thank you for inviting me. So thank you. Thanks so much, Valentina. And thanks again for co-hosting, Akis. Thanks. <laughs> so we will be discussing with Valentina, who is a game designer, a level designer, I think, occasionally a podcast host, co-host, whatever, you know. At the level podcast, design podcast, so, yes. <laughs> yes, at the level design podcast. And we could start from the beginning, if, you, if you're okay with that, and ask you how you decided to go into games. Yeah, for sure. Um, so my, my beginnings were a bit um, uh, unusual for, uh, I guess, a, a game designer. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm from Cyprus. And so when I was finishing high school, uh, as usual, I didn't know what I wanted to do at the point in my life. I was younger than now <laughs> and less wiser <laughs> uh, so I just decided to do a, a bachelor's degree um, in education because um, that was just one of the options I had and I do not regret that it was it was a great uh, four-year like degree it was amazing and actually helped me a lot um, to think about uh, players and, and game design mm. in fact because we we did a lot of um, lesson plans and lesson planning uh, is basically like creating a flow chart for your students. <laughs> mm. um, it is like creating flow charts for players. So you you know you, it has like a uh, player psychology in there. Uh, that's just how I'm connecting it. Anyway, I have to I have to use some of the skills and, and transfer them in, in in game design. And actually, it was pretty easy to do that. And after uh, after that, uh, my course was finished. I. I realized that I actually didn't want to become a teacher. Um, I've always loved games and I was um, kind of involved in them. And, and I realized that I can also make games. Um, and that you was because- You can also teach about making games. <laughs> you can yeah. actually recombine things again. I can become exactly. I can I can do that at one point um, in my life if I wanted to. But yeah, I just, I just didn't feel like I was um, that was my dream job anyway mm. be, being a, an elementary school teacher um so uh, when i mm. saw some games released i think it was 2013 actually yeah um some of these games like the last of us and and gone home even though they're also different they made me think that look at all these stories we can tell in games and something i haven't seen before and and, and gonna be really excited about game development so from since then, I've been just dipping into like Unity or Unreal and then and, and just learning about game development and obviously as a hobby and, and just learning as much as I can because I wanted to be involved. I think at some point um, you, you, you did make some indie games on your own. I do remember you know, your very early stuff. So that was kind of like, it started a little bit afterwards. I was uh, part of my university like degree. We started the, the, the games to that. Uh, so yeah, basically after my education degree, I decided hey, I need to find something game related to study because I think that will also help me personally, but also help me find a, a job like um, to have something like that on my CV. And fortunately there was a um, this master's um, degree uh, back home. I think it was like the first game related degree back mm -hmm. home. And so I jumped at the opportunity. It was a one year kind of like a tense master's degree course on um, computer games and interactive technologies, game design. We learned a lot about a lot of things and we made games during my course there. Um, so while I was working on that, I, I was, uh, I, I made it my goal to like learn as much as I can because mm. I wanted to apply for jobs after that. And I knew that having that on my CV would, would be good, but it would be even better if I had a portfolio, um, because that's kind of how you, you want to become a game designer. You need a portfolio, right? Which um, allow me this, allow me this small parenthesis you know, for the students, for our students who are watching, just like. Yeah, trust for, us i mean we're not for, kidding it's the yeah. portfolios are good one thousand times that we are saying <laughs> that you need to showcase you need your work portfolio. 
Yeah, I think that's what basically got me into the industry. In the end, it was my portfolio because it's something that recruiters can see and they can even play and download your, you know, your studio projects and can try them out. Um, your CV will get you only this far when you're first starting out. It's just text on a paper. It doesn't like impress anyone unless, I don't know, it's very, you know, when you first start out, I think like a portfolio is a great thing. And anyway, that was my goal. Um, and I started applying to various jobs, like literally anything, <laughs> even though I had no, no, uh, experience I applied to all the designer jobs that I could find and all the and there was actually no remote work back then so I knew I, I was I had to move I was going to move at one mm. point and so I was applying to them and also I was applying for QA um, testing jobs because that's also part of the industry and so it's a it's a great way to break into the industry um, and obviously none of these companies replied to me because <laughs> because of various reasons so you know i have an experience uh, i'm i'm in from cyprus and it, that's you know it's a small island it's far away there's there's a lot of complications i don't blame them um so at one point though uh, rockstar north replied to me for a qa tester job it was uh, just a 3 month contract it was very temporary uh, but you know if if they were interested i was never going to say no obviously that's just that's that's another thing that I've learned is like if you have an opportunity, even though it might not be your your uh, final dream goal, just just take it. It doesn't matter. Like it it always helps, and it actually did help a lot. Um, not just because I moved on to to be a designer, which was my ultimate goal, but because I learned so much. Just and I could have also stayed in QA. Like QA was really great. It's it's a different path it's a valid path and, and it was very nice but obviously that's I always wanted to be a designer so I had to move at one point um so yeah Rockstar uh, uh hired me as a QA tester and I worked as a QA tester uh on GTA 5 um on a bunch of the multiplayer uh modes that they've got but I was quickly uh was quickly promoted to a promo designer uh mm -hmm. on Red Dead Redemption 2 where I worked about I think about two years on the the game um and yeah, that was a, a great, huge experience for me. And it was, it was great. Um, so, I mean, just uh, all, all, all the amount of work that goes in into Poly project is amazing. Um, and I sorry, didn't I, to ask you, I mean, what is the, the experience of work, working on something as grandiose and as, I mean, you know, when you're working on such an IP and on such a game that this is going to be, I mean, in most cases, something big, something important, something people will play a lot. And you're part of a, generally speaking, large team. So how, how does the, how does it feel? How could you perhaps even you know describe the process at its simplest, perhaps? Yeah, I feel I don't know. It felt very uh, dreamy in a way. I don't know if that's a nice way to put it, yeah. but it just you don't actually believe that you're working on something that big because you're always focused on what you have ahead. Like you have your tasks, you're focused on them, and then and then it's just. Uh, sometimes you get reminded, hey, I'm working on this huge thing that's going to be released, that you're obviously not, um, you know, I'm, I'm, you're not in charge of releasing that game, you're just uh, working on specific aspects of it. So you, when you get reminded of that, it's just very like, I, I don't know how to, uh, I can't even describe it now, it's very strange, you know, that's not what you expect. And I was basically feeling like that throughout my whole employment because I was never expecting that I would be working on a title like that when I was first like studying for like game design it was it was my dream was like become a designer and not become a designer at Rockstar Games which was like the the you know that was definitely um so I feel very lucky actually for that that's what I'm trying to say um and you, you did mostly level design on this so I was or an like open, open world, world designer. designer. So that yeah. that's just uh, anything that has to do with the open world activities um, right. and and the gameplay that you, you that all the open world has. So like stuff like if you played Red Dead Redemption Two, is like um, you know the encounters you have around mm -hmm. the world, like the hideouts and stuff like that, combat. So anything that isn't basically campaign related, if, if you want to put it right. that, that way. But it it has to be rather technical at points too, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. There has to be quite a lot of scripting involved, and I can imagine. Probably a lot of tools. Oh, 
Uh, tool scripting i mean there is no game that is not made with tools and scripting like even if you want to even the if you're just a, a clean game designer or whatever and, and i'm pretty sure at one point you have to know how to script and you you and might end up just doing that anyway so um, yes thank you for making all those educational points we're not so subtly trying to coax out of you so i mean it's yeah, because when you're young and you imagine a role in the industry and you say, I'm a game designer, I will create the idea, then just, I will chill out. It's not something like that. It's, yeah. it's how, how you call it, it's just an art that uh, is actually also computer science. It's, it's kind of weird. Yeah, yeah, I just think you can study, when we were studying design, we weren't just studying, um, like, you know the theory or anything like that you actually have to implement the stuff and mm. you know you have to open unreal or unit or whatever you're using um and you just you actually in order to make the game you actually have to put make your hands dirty and like go in the engine and start putting the audio in or start like scripting a few things like events and whatnot right and as a designer you you do that a lot right so it's not just hey i want to make uh you don't just have the ideas hey i want to make a game where there's like the cowboy shooting game like Red Dead Redemption 2 and you just leave it at that and let you know you have to actually go in there you know spawn the people make the shootouts so that involves like getting into the engine and doing this stuff like with I think with any game um, especially indie games you can't just be you, you have to get your hands started with everything so I think it's very important for anyone who wants to be a game designer to learn to like script Maybe not program on the very low level, like obviously you don't need to learn physics if that's not going to help you as a game designer, but just basic stuff, uh, how things work. And I think uh, game engines like Unity can, can um, is they're kind of like middle level. You can jump into them and you'll be like, oh no, what is happening? But after a little while, you start learning so much and it can give you a great taste of what it's like to make games, I think, because it, it, it breaks things down in a nice like user-friendly environment uh and and yeah, yeah just I, I, I getting the answer agree, basically yeah. Yeah, yeah and the programming language is is uh, csrp is wonderful for a newbie general in programming i believe basic pro and I, I think if you have basic programming 101 basically um you can jump into c sharp in unity right and it's, mm. it has so much documentation and that's how I'm not a programmer, so I'm just gonna clear that I'm not a programmer, but I started with Unity because it had so much documentation, so much support online, and because it it's just uh, different from actual programming. C sharp in Unity it, like gives you like it has all these libraries and stuff that you can already use. So and and so many tutorials on YouTube. So even if you think you can't program, um, I, I I think you can program uh, at least like high level simple things in unity and you should definitely try that out yeah, yeah. and i and i, I believe I, and i believe that uh, the part of the gameplay scripting is viable for everyone with unity yeah. it's quite easy uh the community is wonderful uh, there are so many tutorials for almost everything i think nowadays mm -hmm. so you can go mm -hmm. there and create your prototype if you're a game designer Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, at, the, at the very least the prototype is something you should more or less be able to do i mean unless it's something really technically demanding and really specialized yeah. and in that case perhaps you can just not work on something that's technical demanding for for like for starting out just yes. copy copy i don't know a game like tetris and try and replicate that in unity or even something simpler like tetris can be uh, maybe a bit more code intensive something that's just so simple like the nope. first level of super mario just something like that yes. and take a like, focus on one thing like that and then you'll learn so much and i think that's like though i am afraid great. that you know, re remaking the first level of super mario and unity might not involve any scripting at all but i, I guess you'll learn I some other stuff <laughs> Yeah, definitely, yes, definitely. But seriously, before, um, I mean, I didn't mean to ask you, be before going on to work on Red Dead Redemption 2, did, had you played the original? Had you? Okay. Yeah, yeah, uh, it was It was actually one of my favorite games back then. So it was It was another thing. Okay, this Part is of even the, dreamier. Yeah, yeah. so this, that's why I, was, I said dreamy, because it was like, oh yeah, it was one of my favorite games, and now I'm suddenly working on SQL. It just makes no sense. Uh, <laughs> okay. um, so it was, yeah, I really loved the first one, yeah. 
Okay, this must I prefer been... the second one now, now, even though I'm definitely biased, but I do prefer <laughs> the second one now. <laughs> yeah, it, it, but I mean, I, I get the, the experience must have been really, really wonderful. And th seriously, since since we, we mentioned the original Red, Red Dead Redemption, I mean, what would you say are your favorite games? I mean, things that sort of really got you into gaming that, that you know, sort of proved to yourself that, oh, this is this is something I really love. This is... This is an mm -hmm. interesting thing to to spend half a life on, something like that. <laughs> so the games that, well, I think the games that got me into game development are like different than the games that <laughs> are that I also like. Well, I don't know, I distinguish it. So I, I played Gone Home, I played The Last of Us and I played Bioshock Infinite. Those were the three games that I saw and I loved because they were just so different but they were so powerful and it made me think oh my god maybe it can be like you know you look at an indie game like go home made i think it was made by four people sorry if i'm just mistaken uh, and you're like oh my god maybe i can join a team that and i can mm. contribute to something small like that it doesn't have to be the last of us and then you look at um stories like the last of us and you're like made by hundreds of people and and they're saying oh you know you can even if you're junior you can join us so i'm like okay maybe i can also be part of like bigger games and then i don't know it's just the the, the those themes those stories and just the community around that time was just something that i don't know felt welcoming mm -hmm. and um inspiring in a way so those were the kind of games that made me think oh maybe I, maybe i can do it too but it doesn't mean that those are my favorite games of all times. Uh, I, I, I enjoy playing a variety of games. And even though, you know, my favorite game could be Marvel Spider-Man, for example, it might not be my top one, but I'm just thinking it could be that, but it, it did not ever draw me to like, I played all the Spider-Man games by the way, but it never made me think, oh, I want to get into the industry and make a Spider-Man game. It was, it was those three games that made me think I want to be part of that culture, you know? um so it's just like it's very interesting actually i mean uh, it makes a lot of sense the way you put it yeah. i mean the fact mm -hmm. that those games showed you that there is a road in that there is you know there's space for 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 effectively everyone every creative person um but no, usually i i always tend to think along the lines of oh this is the game that i really really love you know, effectively monkey island 2 for example Mm -hmm. And this is, you know, not a random, but exactly Monkey Island 2, that, oh, it would be wonderful to work on, on mm -hmm. anything Monkey Island related, which, of course, I'll never, 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 ever do, because no one will ever do that again. But still, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's but a yeah, very like, interesting way uh, of For example, I, I just remember my favorite game, and it's like, I will always say, it, I don't care if any game comes out, Silent Hill has always been my favorite game. Yes. I played, this, I played them as a kid don't tell anybody but like uh i played those games and i was a teenager so obviously anything dark and mysterious fits you know works if you're a teenager so i was really involved with those games i was i absolutely loved them i i listened to the soundtracks i i uh, anything on youtube that you could find i would like consume i was really into that but i never thought yeah i want to join the industry to make silent hill i you know that wasn't what made me Mm -hmm. yeah, start, yeah start I get it. I, I completely yeah. get it. It's just that I never made you know the distinction in my mind, but it's 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 very sensible. Also, Silent Hill is indeed a masterpiece that hasn't aged at all. I would yeah. say. Yeah. So m moving on from Red Dead Redemption Two, I think you also worked on at least another AAA thing, right? After um, that, I actually joined Ant Workshop, which was a. Um, mm -hmm. An indie company is, is an indie company in, in, in Scotland, Edinburgh. And I worked as a freelancer there for a game called Dead End Job, which mm -hmm. released um, on Apple Arcade 2 at the time. And I did a lot of the like design and scripting of the enemies and the combat and the mm -hmm. environments and all of that, which was actually another great, like a very different experience from obviously working on a huge game. But it was actually very valuable because I got to like proper do like you know combat combat work like you know in a mm. 2d shooter game which is you know specifically made for that um and you know you i get got to do work on the in the environments there setting up the props and you know um all of that and working a little bit more with like um more procedural elements because that mm -hmm. job is like a more procedural so that was quite fun and different and I think actually I learned, even though I was 
I think I worked about a year, a bit less, maybe than a year there. I mm-hmm. learned like a ton. Uh, it was very nice. And it that that was like um that that project made me realize that um the working on indie games was something I preferred um in the end because mm. I got to do like a lot of things. It wasn't it wasn't specialized to something specific like the optimal design, you just do that. Um so it was it was a really great experience there. Yeah, um, I was meaning to ask you that. I mean, comparing the two experiences, I mean, comparing the the triple A studio with uh, you know double A or or indie or I mean, you you said you prefer the indie type of work. It's, it's yeah, more creative, so more more. I think I have. I think there is. Um, I think the creative part is what like interested me the most. Yeah, I, I just felt like I had more um freedom you know if you work on Red redemption 2 you you are restricted to specific things of the franchise you know like we always you have your specific spe- specific role so it's it's very different than working on um an indie game that's like uh it's the first of it's it's not a franchise but, uh, at least the first one that was worked on as far as i know and you know just working on different things that combine a lot of stuff so you would implement and the animations and the sounds and you would implement all in the combat and the level design and you would just work on all the things and you just I, I personally feel like if I um if I work on all the things it's it's more personally fulfilling um to me and that that's that's the main reason I liked it yeah yeah that makes a lot of sense and also I would say you are you are currently working on an indie game correct yes Yes. Yes, you are. You're working on uh, Welcome Home with uh, CMD. Yes. And I don't know. Maybe maybe we could. I don't know, Valentina, if you would like to you know, share the the site on, on your screen. Yeah. So well, so we have a um, website. Um, I can just share my screen. Mm-hmm. Uh, let me just give me a second to try that. So. And um, maybe we could chat about streaming? that a bit. Yeah, yeah. that's fine. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so yeah, we're working on a on a game called Welcome Home. It's part of the um, um, the horror stories anthology, and it's a game about um, our tagline. Well, you can see it on the screen. It's like a murder mystery that's played backwards and forwards. Um, but that what that basically means is like we we have like these two different timelines. One is in the nineteen eighties. One of them is the nineteen twenties, and in one of them you who has this mysterious killer that um, kind of infiltrates um, a house for mysterious reasons. And yeah, not spoiling anything. Um, and at the same time, you can switch to the more like the 1980s where you play as a tourist visiting that house, but it has become a museum. So we're really like trying to to so that kind of like uh, museum part of an old house where you go and like look at things and find out more info mm-hmm. in, in that way, you know, where you have your, um, um, those like, we'll call them audiomatics in the game and they, they like give you some information like audio information and kind of like a, it's a fitting kind of um, scenario for exploration and like investigation. So you, you do that in the museum um, part of the game, that timeline, and uh, and and then the information you find in that timeline can be helpful to you as a killer in the in the in the past. So you can freely switch um, between those two characters. Say you found a specific thing, a specific information in 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 the museum that told you maybe how the killer managed to open a door or something. So you're like, oh, okay, this this might be useful because I, I was playing as a killer and I couldn't go through that door, yeah? So now you go back and you like kind of use that information to, with the killer to, to figure out, you know, what you have to do to open the door. And this is, this is kind of like the back and forth that we want to establish this kind of like, um, it, it's, it's, it is more like of a, a linear story but because you can switch back and forth and and solve the puzzles um however like you see like in the order yet that it works for you it's also in that sense not linear um, yes i mean I, I have been keeping an eye on the game for, for quite some time and it's i mean this mechanic is sounds deeply fascinating i don't know have you have 
Had you ever played the the demo released for the Fire Night game? You know, a few. The demo? No, I played Fire Fire. Okay, if, if you remember itself. the first scene where you have where you effectively where effectively the game promises that you know what you do as one character really deeply influences what the other car what you as the other character has to do. Mm-hmm. And that was something that started off wonderful in the game and then was completely forgotten. So that one that one's a bit different because we don't actually influence the so mm-hmm. for example, if you find information in the museum, you can't actually influence the events in the previous timeline those things already happened in a way right and with the as you play as the killer you might not know what to do so you're like lacking that kind of information okay how did that infiltrate the house is the question for example so in in the museum you find that information and then you apply Mm -hmm. it as a killer therefore you're kind of like um, sure confirming of history basically instead of like influencing and changing history yeah, but I you sort of are I mean since you're <laughs> passing through the information yeah, it reminds me one of my favorite mechanics in, uh, in an adventure game from the day of the dead uncle that you mm. go from the future to the past in general it's, it was one of my favorite moments from the day of the dead uncle so it, mm-hmm. I, I really like this interaction so mm-hmm. I think that uh, you're gonna find new ways to to twist this to twist this mechanic. Mm-hmm. Yes. So uh, our kind of like I think influence was uh, at least my personal was like Outer Wilds, and I know that's a very different game. That's kind of like an open mm. world, and there's no like switching back and forth like timelines or whatnot. But the idea that the information and the stuff that you have to do is already there in the environment, you just don't know about it until you read or hear about it in the in the tourist timeline. And then you switch back and you kind of apply it and you're like, oh, it was there all along or oh, that's what I had to do. That's kind of like a little bit the feeling that uh, I can I can describe it for you. It's not it's not like um, um, the level in Dishonored where you have the, right. the mantra and you could switch time. Pe- the, you, had, you had the time piece, I think it was called mm-hmm. or something. Yeah. And you could switch, but you could influence the timelines, I think, in that one. Um, so you could like, if you did one thing in, in, in one timeline, it would change in the other and stuff like that. Right. And your your uh, role on this one is uh, game designer, correct? Yeah, so I'm a, I'm a lead game designer on this. Um, yeah, we've been working on this for a little while. And yeah, it's still in still development. Obviously, it's not released. Um, don't know if I mentioned that. Yeah, so it's still in development. Uh, we have the website, which um, you can check out. There's more information there uh, and whatnot. Some of screenshots and a couple of videos um, for you to look at um, if you want to find out more but yeah the gist is this that you have like these two characters they're in different scenarios but the information shared between them is like um the, the mechanic of the game basically yes and and the thing is that already i mean the artwork that you have you know published is is evocative as hell i mean it, it really works it, it really gives you this well it sells you the atmosphere i know what the game will deliver obviously but i mean it, it sort of promises very interesting things or at least things that are you know very close to what i would like to <laughs> to play so yeah please yeah, please we'll have a bunch <laughs> of stuff you know it's it's very different because it's, all, it's also fun to work if you think about it, it's two timelines are, are centered mm. around this house and they're meant to be different right like how is the house meant to, to be in the 1920s and how is it, how has that changed into museum in the 1980s um that is very old fascinating and I, I i like places like that like um you know in games where you can go and think the last of us too had the dinosaur museum or like uh spider-man miles morales had another scientific museum and then you just walk and hear and learn about all that stuff but that's just big, a big a small part in a big adventure game and mm. this is kind of like just taking the small part and expanding on it and just making it into uh, the actual game itself um that i think is like really fascinating for for me at least yeah, for I think for us too, right? Okay. Uh, <laughs> oh, one question, uh, Valentina. I'll, uh, I've already linked the website to the chat. Uh, is the game up on any store on Steam or something else? Welcome home. Right now, not currently. No, we we have the website. We want to have it somewhere um, soon enough. So maybe I can share a link in the future. But right now, it's just it's just the website okay. that we have. 
just asking for wishlist, you know, etc. So we can go and follow wishlist the game. Uh, well, you can you can follow the um, our Twitter account though. Okay. Uh, Welcome has a Twitter account. Um, let me just ah. oh, quickly uh, take a look before I forget. If and that will give you like all all like um the updates for sure, and, and whenever the game will be available for like wishlist or whatnot. Out. At HS or Welcome is out home. at Welcome Home. Yes, at HS Welcome Home. Okay. Okay. I found you. Uh, and how, how many people are working on that? Like, I mean, the, the core team, how how big is it? Would you say? So we're this, there's a few people. And there's also, like, um, people who come and go mm -hmm. on, on smaller things. Um, so it always kind of changes it's not like and we're a very small team so it's not it's less like less than five people say core team uh so it's not like a it's not a big studio and we all just sh wear different hats and, and you mm -hmm. know kind of share responsibilities um and, and i really have to ask you how is working with mark <laughs> I mean... mark if you're listening to this <laughs> no no it's it's been great really i like mark has great ideas and he has the ability to just give us the freedom to Mm -hmm. he knows the people who he hires have like specific talents and he's like well you're really good at that i'm giving you the freedom to do that you know and that's kind of like what i like there's no like restriction or like second guessing or anything you know i'm good at this and we do you know i i don't have to like ask like you know how in in in, in like big companies you have to go through chains of emails to like yes. finally uh, you know, yes. we we don't obviously have that, so it's that kind of freedom that is really nice. Yeah, that that sounds pretty brilliant, actually. And uh, another thing I wanted to ask you, I mean, how do you approach the you know the design of the initial idea, I mean, not not its evolution, not the you know the iteration and fleshing out, the, but I mean, how do you approach the forming the initial? idea for for a game for me for say the initial idea for for welcome home does it you know yeah. be fully formed as a as, as a you know as an atmosphere or a feeling you're trying to to capture as a mechanic is yeah. it always the same so, so for i can only speak for myself because this is i with every person is different so if you talk hmm. to a narrative or a writer a narrative designer or a writer they'd be like oh the um for me, it's the characters that pop in my head first, and then I start thinking about the game from that. Or if you talk to an artist, maybe they have uh, the feel and the mood in their heads and they sketch it down. Like for me, it's always about, I have I kind of have like this Excel sheet in my head, which is populated with, okay, uh, how many team members are working on this? Um, what is the scope of it? Uh, what mechanics do we have, don't have, and what we can use? and how long the game is going to be, you know, it's kind of like these kind of factual things. Uh, mm -hmm. And I'm trying to like, they're already in here somewhere. So when I think of like um, creating new ideas or like, I always kind of try and restrict myself because I think that's mm -hmm. the, for me personally, is the best way to like come up with stuff is to put restrictions on yourself. And then you kind of have to work within those restrictions instead of everything being open-ended and then you know, I end up coming up with an RPG multiplayer MMO idea that, you know, it cannot happen. So for me, it's all about restricting and thinking, okay, so what uh, are we, okay, A, we're working on a horror game, what kind of horror game what can we make? Um, then maybe thinking about a unique selling point that can be a mechanic, for example, and then mechanic of work from home, it's about switching those characters and finding that information. And just like uh, high level ideas like that without, mm. without getting too deep into uh production uh, based ideas so like oh how long is this mechanic going to take me exactly so it's like okay maybe we've decided this mechanic we decided it'll be like i don't know three levels we decided it's gonna be like two hours or whatever so it's thinking about those ideas and then breaking them down um right. that, that's kind of how like i work uh but how ideas are formed i think that's uh that's kind of hard and different like I said for everybody for me I like to um, just brainstorm but using like those restrictions um, so yeah like for welcome home I don't remember actually how we ended up choosing um, but you know it's it's not like you don't have everything fully fleshed from the beginning not everything is clear 
Um, right. So I think it starts with like uh, smaller steps, high level things, and then you break those high level ideas into smaller steps. And that's how you end up with, with, the, with the game idea. You can always do like, there's always different ways to come up with ideas. Like um, I remember I used to like, I talked about this exception in my head, but I, I, I like using that also to come up with uh, just game ideas. Like, um, for example, if we wanted to make a one hour game and that's a restriction, for example, mm. then then I can use that to think, okay, what what mechanics can I use? I obviously can't make uh, any mechanics that are in The Last of Us or in Spider-Man. So what can I use? Can we maybe find um, tools and assets that will help us prototype this idea? So, so it's, it's just, I don't know, I guess it's very gameplay uh, uh, based like mm. how I how I think about things you know I, I never start with like mood because I I feel like I can if I come, come up with a mood that is gonna be two million you know dollars to make then there's no point you know so I kind of start thinking about those restrictions what can I do the mood will come afterwards for me you know that kind of stuff the characters will come afterwards the narrative will come afterwards mm. Makes sense, actually. And I also like the, the spreadsheet analogy. I mean, uh, I don't think the amount that we all spend populating spreadsheets is, is you know, obscene, effectively. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I honestly didn't know that. I, I, I only recently, like a couple of years ago, started working on a, on a pen and paper RPG contract. And they're using it too. I mean, everyone is using spreadsheets. Everything is being fleshed out in little cells and, and rows and columns and it's it's amazing when you can actually you know sort of have that built in in the way you think at least when approaching design yeah it be might super be helpful. Because, i think i think i developed that after working though with games and uh -huh. it's not it's not how i started i i i started with the most random ideas that probably cannot be done you know and then the more you work in games um, and you know, with different games like Ant Workshop, Red, Red Dead Redemption Two, it's like they're just so different. Then you start to see, uh, maybe when you work uh, in a triple A company, the sky's the limit, right? And then you don't have to think about that. But then when you work in a small company, well, you have to know your limits, and then you work with those. So it's like I only developed that, obviously not when I first started my master's degree or anything. Like way, way later, and that's just how my brain works at this point in all like excel sheets <laughs> um so is there anything else you could perhaps you know share on the welcome home murder mystery double timeline game anything else we can we can mention from the site that mm, no i think kind of covered a lot about yes. like welcome home um it's a first person game it's a first person ah, like, narrative so experience something. um yeah so you just you use that perspective um and you interact with items you can read stuff you can listen to stuff um and yeah it's more of an investigation exploration game i guess i don't know if i mentioned nice. that so it's it's not an action game there's no like shooting or like driving cars or stuff like that um right so yeah and i think that's the best way to say and there's a knock on the on the CMD Studio uh, Twitter account and, and probably yes, the other social. The there's knock, this knock knock um, the twenty eighth. The knock knock the twenty eighth. That's tomorrow actually. Ooh, yes, so I would just I would just suggest that's what I'm gonna say for that to just uh, either follow our account or take a look tomorrow uh, of what that is. Yes. I don't okay. want to spoil anything, but there there is something tomorrow that's coming. <laughs> maybe maybe you can tell us later on and we will edit it in in, <laughs> you know, in a later version of the video I mean, uh, the more after the one. 28th <laughs> yes, after, after on the 29th when a, a new video will go live and i don't think i meant to ask you I mean, you you and and mark are still doing the level design podcast which is i don't know probably the, the biggest level design podcast around i think i think so yeah i think it's, yeah. it's it's big we have like excellent excellent content and how did that come around well i didn't actually start with the, uh the level design podcast or anything i joined more than halfway through as a co-host mm, actually yeah. so i don't know actually how it started and and whatnot i I don't want to say i think it might have started an EGX, but I, I i'm not sure so i don't i'm not i don't want to like 
say that but it, it's, it, it's going strong still yeah yeah so we, we have a lot of like you were on it too yes and Dinos was uh, on it and we yes. yeah we focus on we try to focus on level design and we obviously can talk about other stuff that influence level design like mm -hmm. maybe lighting or maybe even you know when we think of level design we think of like oh buildings and linearity but like we talk to you about landscapes and mm -hmm. And we talk to other people about, um, for example, vegetation and plants on this kind of like oh, yeah, world recently, maps. Very recently. Yeah. And, and, you know, there's all these kind of like different things about lighting or like just anything you can think of that can influence level design. And yeah, it's it's always great to talk about with people. Um, it's through the lens of level design, but we always chat about random things, other random things too that are important, which is, is always nice, you know. Um, because you, you get these people on the podcast that are experts in their field and then you also learn stuff from them. It's, yeah, yeah I, I would yeah. definitely follow that if you're interested in level yes, design. I, and I just... think I managed to post a, a link to the YouTube chat. Did, did you manage? Where am I? So yeah, did the I? podcast is on, I think it's on Spotify, Apple and all those kind of like anchor and whatnot. Yes, anchor.fm. Like... So it's kind of like a bit everywhere, but if you don't want to listen to it and you, you want to just be on youtube and have a video playing that's also available and the the recent videos have recordings of of the people like this one now like oh, right, we, you. we actually talk about it so it's oh. viewable so now um i had completely missed that evolution to be honest yeah yeah so yeah it's about the bunch it's it's well, always nice. fun to talk to people and now it's on youtube too so yeah excellent okay. and i don't know what, what, I guess you you want to you have this face that seems to be wanting uh, to ask something. No, no, I just posted the, <laughs> the Twitter from Level Design Podcast because okay, I'm a <laughs> huge fan. I found it like one year ago from Costantinos. Hmm. So, so it has been a year since we talked to Costantinos. It was it it was more during one. the first lockdown. Uh, yeah, maybe oh more God. than a year actually. It's more than one year. Yes. It's been so long. Yes. Wow. Okay. Yes. okay. But it yeah. feels even longer. See, that's so, that's the horrible thing with a pandemic. I posted the yeah. link so uh, people on the chat go and follow Level Design Podcast and Valentin, of course. Yes. Uh, so and... uh, I have some questions in general from the from mm -hmm. the chat. Yeah. Before we go to those, can I ask okay. one one last thing, okay. uh, Valentin? Do you? Do you have any even vague plans for the you know future in general? I mean, as in things you would like to do, things you're sort of planning to do in you know, the next few years, like not immediately. Um, you mean career-wise, obviously. Um, career-wise, and you know, creatively in general. I started a blog actually a little while ago called Thoughts, and it's just mm -hmm. me uh, when I. When I really like game or something I don't like about a game, I just try and break it down in my head and then write it down as a blog. So I'm hoping to work on that. It's obviously uh, something that needs a lot of maintaining, hmm. you know, capturing video screenshots, all that, writing these things down, editing it. So it does take a while and I haven't haven't done it in a little while, but that's something that I want to continue doing because it, it's, it's more like personal thing. It helps me. Hmm. Um, break down the games and think about them and also like whoever's interested in that that the design aspect of that can also read that so I would like to keep working on that um, on on the side um, but yeah currently we are working on welcome home on a bunch of projects and so I think that's like kind of like where I see myself what I see myself doing right now is just working on those projects <laughs> Makes sense. So, I guess, please, uh, okay. on to you and the questions from the chat. Okay, someone is asking, what exactly is a QA tester? Reviewing the game and giving feedback during its development? A QA tester is um, a person who will uh, have play, play the game, but with a specific plan in mind. So, you have specific tasks um, that you need to look into. And it by playing the game, I don't mean you started from beginning to like finish. It could be like task for playing <clears throat> mission eight or the specific mode or and then you're kind of like 
in not in charge of that. Yeah, you're in charge of, of testing that part over and over again in, in different ways, according to a specific plan. And yeah, you, as you test, you will take obviously in specific information from the bugs that you find, and you need to like document that uh, and, and pass that on to developers. And it can be, you can be a tester actually in, in different ways. So you can be a tester that tests the gameplay. You can be someone who tests the art, just art stuff. You can be someone who tests all the audio. Um, that would mean like, you know, playing specific parts of the game and making sure that things, audio triggers the right way or uh, it plays when it needs to. And, or art, it could be, you could be testing the, the models, you could be testing the level, uh, the, the worlds. Uh, you could be actually just testing textures and stuff like to see, hey, is this implemented well? So there's, there's, there's different types of QA testing. Um, I mentioned I was on, on, a, on multiplayer modes, but there's, all, there's a lot of paths in QA. You can even do um, QA on like, more like research QA, like uh, development support. And, you know, that's uh, maybe researching like, uh, or testing website and stuff like that. So it's all about basically testing a specific uh, feature of a, of a product and finding anything that's wrong with it and, and making sure it's documented really well because you want to pass that to a developer and they, they need to see that it's, you need, they need to see immediately what the issue is, what it's, what, how it's uh, meant to work and what were the steps you you did to like um, get this issue because it needs to be make certain you know, that it's clear. it's to replicate actually yeah so you know how to replicate it and um, specifically in, in rockstar north did you also uh, i mean were you also expected to or at least encouraged to you know perhaps pass on, pass on some advice i mean for example this doesn't work should be enough or this breaks down when you do that and that or, or did you also get in certain i mean probably this design related stuff get to suggest something i mean i get I, confused i personally wasn't working on that on the as a QA tester, i wasn't doing the the design stuff so i'm not sure if i can mm. answer that okay. uh, question i was i was mainly like testing the modes and finding issues with them so right. that was my, that's why i said there's such a, so many different paths that yeah you know i only know that part um but Probably, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> it, it depends. I mean, it, it really depends on the company's culture. I mean, it's not like you can't culture. say, oh yeah, would you know? It's not like you're not allowed to like give yeah, like, advice and feedback, but it's uh, it's up to the developers and like you know, producing and all that stuff to like uh, see if that's like uh, something that can be done or if it's good advice and feedback. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Aki, you want to to read yeah. some more from the questions? Of course. Oh, one good question here uh, what is the best way for a programmer to promote his work a parenthesis mm. reddit website etc even if the far future goal is a game designer role will mm. someone stick and work on a specific engine okay so i would take my advice with a grain of salt because i, I i'm not uh, like i said i'm not like a hundred percent a programmer but i think if you want to work in games as a programmer uh, these days you are kind of required to show that you can you can you have to show that in in this, some sort of portfolio so if for example you made a game you programmed me programmed it yourself that would be good to have on, on the portfolio even it doesn't have to have great art it can just be a prototype a lot of the things that i've been seeing with with that kind of stuff is like for example you open up unreal and you script how a specific gun works or how to drive or you you program how to like the character moves and it's just gray boxing so there's there's no like art or anything interesting in there it's just making prototypes of mechanics mm -hmm. or it just depends like i said like if you're a programmer on physics your portfolio would it would be most likely it would be good to include things that include physics like car car physics for example or if you want to be a programmer on weapons because those are all specialized like um jobs these days so you kind of have to decide which one do you like most and kind of focus on that so if you want to do like um gameplay programming it would be creating uh systems for for the game um systems such as um 
in Far Cry 6, how does like, um, like, you know, how do you um, call a vehicle to come over to you and you would script the system. Oh, okay, it needs to spawn nearby, and, you know, there's an AI driving it or whatever. And then you like, make sure that it doesn't spawn on other uh, random objects. So it would be like something like that. Uh, and, and then the designers can use it. So if you want to be a gameplay programmer, it will be something maybe maybe scripting something like that. Now, I don't know if you can, if people share their C, C++ or C Sharp like work actually in the portfolio. I don't think that's a thing. <laughs> yeah, so it would be just best to like a gray box level, you work on a, a feature or on a game. And if you wanna be a generalist programmer, then maybe just make different, separate different things uh, instead of focusing on one aspect. <clears throat> But if you want to be like, if you want to be like, like I said, a physics programmer, then just just focus on that. Makes a little sense. So uh, let me let me read a <clears throat> couple comments. Um, one of them uh, is that Red Dead Redemption Two is one of uh, left out Johnny's favorite open worlds in a video game ever. The area of the map with the old lighthouse and the entirety of Saint Denis is beautiful and so inspiring. And then Revenger. <laughs> once again agrees that Silent Hill is uh, superb <laughs> and, and brilliant and we covered this question and now um, Jorgos asks whether you could share the title of your master's program and I actually if... think my master's program is not available anymore so I can ah, okay. I, I think okay let me let me quickly try and find what mm. it was exactly when I joined but I think it's not available anymore um Sorry, quickly. It was it was called Design and Development of Computer Games and Interactive Technologies, and it was part of the um, computer science. It was a collaboration, I think, of the computer science department and the uh, department of multimedia. <clears throat> Can't speak anymore. <clears throat> yeah, sorry. Of the that. multimedia and graphics it's, arts, so it was like a combination. Water. I am, but it's not, work, it's not working. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, uh, it nice. was it was at um, the university called Tepac. Tepac. Um, in Cyprus, okay. but I'm not sure if it exists anymore. Actually, I think it must have stopped. So, or, or maybe it may have evolved into something else. Or perhaps maybe changed. A, yeah, I think so. Like um, maybe an undergraduate just... thing, perhaps. I don't know. It they could be. Yeah. It. But that's um, what it was called. Okay. Like, so yeah. thanks for that. And now uh, we have a couple questions from uh, Sotiris, and he asks, "Do you believe that it's mandatory to start in school about game development, or?" Can you learn what you need from the internet? Um, if yes, do you have to start from the bachelor's or go straight to the master's? Um, well, okay. I'm so from my experience, uh, let's just recap. I was in Cyprus, so I believed, I strongly believed that I had to study something, not because I couldn't learn it myself. A lot of the stuff that I learned, I, I learned it by myself. Um, but it was it was crucial for me to have something on my CV that said. Yeah, this person actually put in the work at the university because it was my only chance to be hired abroad. And, mm -hmm. and I, I kind of knew that it was something that had to be on a piece of paper. I couldn't have studied education, elementary education, where you teach children in schools and then apply with that, you know, as a want to be a game designer. It, it would have been really hard. So for me, it really helped. I don't actually think it's necessary, though, for the work mm -hmm. like you can everything can be taught online and um, just enough willpower to learn it. I think that that covers it. Uh, but I know, unfortunately, that a lot of studios are looking for degrees. And I think it's just something to consider um, realistically that um, sometimes studios don't hire if you don't have a degree. Although I don't agree with that. I think like there's a lot of, you can have a portfolio, you, you can have the skills and you can showcase your skills to a portfolio and that should be enough. So yeah. I, think it, I, think it, I think it's a difficult question and I definitely don't have the right answer. I just know what worked for me. And for me, it was a combination of, because I was in Cyprus and it's a small island to, to have something on my CV that, because when I looked at CVs of other people, right, that worked in the gaming industry, they all had something. They might have had computer science, they might have had graphics and arts when they, when if they were working on art. So they, they always had something. And if I came over from 2000 miles away and I said, hey, I'm a teacher, please hire me as a game designer, I knew it just wouldn't work. So I think it always depends on the situation where you live, 
what you can afford um, and like where do you want to apply um, I think it all it all really depends. I, I do believe though having a portfolio is a hundred percent like the best thing that you can have, whether you have a degree or not. So that should be like the base and default. And you can go from there. You can start applying. Truth, truth be said, I'm in certain degrees because I'm I'm watching the uh the, the chat in the in the chat. Mm -hmm. Uh I mean, you know, if you have a degree exactly in computer science and, and perhaps you're a mathematician or or someone who's you know majored in physics or something like that, I mean you have something that is considered vaguely related then i mean you know architects yeah. are countless yeah. architects and stuff so maybe if you're if you can think or if you feel that your degree is related maybe that should be enough to, to yeah yeah it usually it works like like that too yeah. if you have something that's relating to what you want to do in games that that also works like I said, I think portfolio is like the best thing to have. You can mm. also already start applying to to jobs with that. And if you see that that's not enough um, for some opportunities that you that you want to go after, then perhaps you don't don't think you need like a bachelor's. Maybe like um, even some courses like that actually give you credentials on on what you want to have. Like yeah, at least um, they're handy. Uh, sorry, another yeah. question is uh, okay, which game engine is bearing your opinion? Okay, that's difficult. But, um, I mean, yeah, he, uh, the, the person let's, asked let, me, let's like, start the, a war, yeah, but let's, let's start let's, an engine. Let's war. not answer yeah. that. Uh, sorry, sorry, so it is, but it's little. Let's, 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 let's move. Should we not start a war? We, we can start a war by saying that the best engine is the engine you create yourself, but never do that. Oh, yes, <laughs> but don't do that. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and after Don't this, you, that, you go just... crazy when yeah. you create your own game yeah. engine. But I guess I have to ask you: Have you ever fantasized about creating your whole engine by yourself, or not? <laughs> <laughs> he has. Well, he actually has. Because... I know he has. He, 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 he has this this look, which uh, is the... <laughs> you know, you know, creating mm. a game engine was the common thing like ten years ago. Yeah, mm. and I have created okay. my own, not the full version of a game engine, but something that I could create something simple. Uh, yeah. But nowadays, it depends how much money you have actually, <laughs> and what you want to do. Uh, there are mm. other solutions for if you want just to learn, just pick up Unreal or Unity, whatever you like, and learn. But a big company probably the best solution for some specific mm. is to create its own game engine. Uh, yeah, if we want to evolve this question a bit more so it's not about what's the best engine we can like um like for example i know unreal engine was used to make days gone which is a sony AAA game and i also know it's been used for like indie development um, but then there's also ubisoft has its own what is it called frostbite engine so it just it depends on the projects but obviously i would i would argue that for independent development maybe don't waste your money and time on creating one from scratch sure. um, uh, another question by Anastasia um, who knows that okay, the gaming world is indeed very male dominated in both uh, it's creative and you know uh, uh, the the people who enjoy it audience thank you both as an audience and as a creator and the question is, is what it's like what is it like working in games as a woman mm, I think everything is sort of male dominated in all industries mainly because the the higher ups are usually men and so i think it's just you know if you worked in tech it would probably be the same if you work somewhere in a graphic studio it would probably be the same so i'm not i'm not sure uh, what's i can't say oh it's what's the difference like between mm. this and another industry i just assume it's the same but yeah it's not great obviously being the you know being part of a handful of, of women in, in games and i think that's just um that's kind of sad that because we you know you need different people and, and you need that diversity to to exist to create to have a, a a positive working environment and just to create like better products even i think it always is better when you have different voices from different people and it's yeah it can sometimes be hard because it you can feel lonely or you know i've or you you know there's like stories obviously from online that 
you know, the environments are working environments cannot be great. So, but in different, like in comparison to other industries, I can't, I can't say I only worked in this industry. So I'm just assuming, you know, with any male dominated industry, it will, it will be the same. Um, for me, I didn't like, I did I, right now in my current situation, I don't, I don't feel like, um, I feel like I'm privileged and I'm in a good position to work with great people and I don't have any problems yeah. like that. But I can imagine if you're working with like a big team and it's just, you know, male driven, then it kind of becomes like, well, you're just the, the person who kind of stands out and your voice might not be backed up as much because there's uh, no other women there too. Or, and you can, you can have stuff like that, which I, are not that, that great. Yeah. True. But I, mean, I do have this feeling that you know, this is sort of slightly, slowly changing perhaps i mean there are more women that you know make it uh, they actually make it big in games and and they because i mean they're still i think it's not we still haven't reached 50 percent but yeah i, I think, think it's we're getting slowly better. getting there uh, and uh, and it's it's uh, i know it's not super connected or it might be at least in my opinion when what made me say i want to join this industry is when i play you know games like the last of us and gone home were actually not so, then they were in games that were very male oriented at all like even though yeah the last of us had joel like ellie was a start of that a star of that, that game and gone home was about two girls falling in love so it was you have this diversity in these games and then you're like oh is this where the gaming industry is headed you know and it's kind of like a part that made me see and maybe I, I belong there. And obviously we might not be the majority, but I think through the, the games we make and, and the art we make, we can also help uh, inspire more women to join the industry because that's how, how I got inspired too. And the more women we have in the industry, I think the, the yeah, it will be obviously. Yes, I mean, actually seeing women do something, there's, it's, it's the irrefutable proof that, look, you could do it too. I mean, it's not necessarily... A gender thing so that's yeah there's there's no like reason why not to have all, all this it's just we just need to open the gates and both with the with how studios are hiring and both like with the games we make uh, i think there's been like um, huge leaps at least in comparison to what like 20 years ago um so yeah it's, it's only gonna get better i wouldn't discourage any woman from joining the gaming industry you can always hear and read stuff about but i think like a lot of interests just have that and and it's all about persevering i mm -hmm. guess in the end i think that's what i would say true uh sorry guys i sort of lost the the trail so uh one question is what's the gender ratio like in your team i mean on, on its average um i mean i'm working on an institute now that there's people coming and going freelancers yeah. so there's actually I don't think there's a, like a, a ratio right now like, <laughs> <laughs> because we work with a, you know we work with a concert artist that uh, um, was a woman and a marketer and and it's like but you know they don't they might not stay with us like for very long um mm -hmm. yeah so, it, for it, a few it, months. so it's like it doesn't i, I don't think i can actually say yeah, it comes and goes um, <laughs> but i'm i'm the lead designer on our project marketer our director you know so the main the two core people are already 50 50 you think you have like a 50 50 male female and the 50 50 mustache no mustache thing <laughs> yeah, is, yeah yeah which is yeah mustaches are underrepresented too yeah, yeah it I should mean, be is, i always told mark it should be like a tagline of the studio should be a mustache <laughs> <laughs> like this like the logo it's just like perfect yes that 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 would work wonderfully and uh, sorry let me see do we have uh, i think do, did you see any other questions i'm missing uh, perhaps uh, did we say the the question about the uh can can you be a game developer directly or do you have to know stuff from computer science well yeah game developer is, is a very wide yeah i was just going to say i'm assuming uh, you mean developer program. just pro developer slash programmer yeah um i think i think yeah i think, I think it's a vague a terminology in general because a game developer can be everyone in the team mm. that actually yeah. improves the game or adds some features but it depends the programming that actually doing in your team if you go to the low level stuff you need to come from a computer science background if you only about gameplay scripting or some high level systems probably 
they don't need to know the stuff how uh, the hardware works, how the the graphics API works, etc. It depends what you are doing. If you go to lower level stuff, you need to have a background, obviously. Mm. If yeah. you do, uh, if you take this cube and you make it to move, you don't need to do that because game engines are wonderful tools, and you just need to know how this game engine works in order to manipulate the the behaviors. Something yeah, like I that. agree. And one thing I would add is also even unless you want to be a game pro- programmer, computer science, like as a degree, I don't think it's needed. But mm-hmm. if you want to learn a little bit how programming games work, or even uh, if you want to be a gameplay scripter, which means like, I don't know, firing off events, gameplay events at specific times or implementing like uh, the AI or sounds, it, I think uh, a one-on-one on programming will be helpful. And by one-on-one, I don't mean like, uh, just super basics like what does it mean to loop things um, mm. um what does it mean to have variables and stuff like that because yeah. you you will use those things and it's more more like uh programming logic rather than actually programming right Aki? so it's not it's about learning the logic a little bit of how those things work rather than how do i code it yeah it, it depends how much you want to it's a, it's a crazy situation i believe that uh, all of these technology, all of these tools are crazy technology that uh, a lot of people spent years of making. Mm-hmm. So uh, the high level stuff, uh, if you just practice for one year and take some courses, probably you can reach a point that you can actually understand and you can create your own solutions. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, when you go deep and you, for example, you want to do shaders and computer graphics, yeah, that's, that's difficult. You need to, you know a lot of stuff. You can learn it yeah. yourself. A lot of people learn programming by, by themselves. They don't need education, but uh, that's why education exists. Education is for some people. Some other people can learn without having a deadline for an assignment. Mm. Uh, yeah. But uh, it, it depends because we have the game engine and all the tools. And for most of the stuff, you need a programmer to make them. And uh, for the other stuff that, that to create uh, the game flow, to for example, you go to this door and you change scene, etc. Simple yeah. scripting things. Yeah. You just can I even also add from my experience. I did like um, in one of the courses that I had to do my master's degree was just a programming course that was just literally the one on one, but it actually taught me less <laughs> or not it, it was a good course for programmers but i did not learn anything game related to it because it was a it, it was just very low level uh, so i actually learned programming by working on the games themselves like you said i guess like you 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 will get to know the things that you need to know and while working on the projects um, and unless it's like just some logic stuff, the programming course is gonna start talking to you about weird mathematical like stuff that I had no idea what was going on. I, I actually did not do well on that, but I I can literally script a game from start to finish now. And mm. that's because it's just very high level programming. And I learned that through the engines and stuff. And I would totally fail at any computer science course, but I can, script i scripted in all my game jobs and you know they're not it's it's a very different kind of mindset right so um now if you both agree i say one final question and then we can you know let you relax a bit sometime <laughs> i mean it's okay. getting late already so i would say that um that the one question we haven't really touched upon at all would have to be the one regarding re- replayability and how much do you take it into account when designing? Which is, I imagine it's per project, but so yeah, that's the question. How much? Yeah, do so you I would say it? it's like, I would say it's per project. I, I was never in charge of, say, uh, will the game be replay- replayable? But I do like personally adding things in, in games that, uh, whether well, like there's a hidden, like, room or whether there's like um hidden messages or stuff like that that 
you might say, hey, it's um, let's take amnesia uh, rebirth. Like it's a linear game. You can say that there's like the replay replayability in, in those terms is like maybe zero. But if you play it again, you might start seeing things that now that you know how the story evolved, like make more sense. You might discover more like hidden paths. And in that sense, it has re replayability. So that's how I'm thinking about games. I don't, I don't think of them in terms of like monetization and, and like battle royale kind of replayability. That's, um, I think that's a whole genre by itself. But in, in the games, I do like to think of, hey, maybe if we add this detail or like this extra hidden thing, that's not going to take that too long to make. Or maybe a reference here and there, like when they play it the first time, they'd be like, oh, maybe if I play it again now, because I enjoyed it. And then you'll see those things. You'll start seeing them more because you didn't notice them before. So in that sense, I think of probability is, is something nice and interesting to add in games, yeah. Excellent. So um, seriously, Valentina, thank you so, so much for uh, being here. And thank you so much for, for inviting me. Yeah, it's, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for taking the time to answer you know, all the questions. Yeah. Um, Aiki, thank you too, here. Yeah, and thank <laughs> you too. Uh, I, I am in charge of the chat mostly, so I will ask the people in the chat to go for Valentina, the, the game, support Valentina and the work, the CMD studio, and of course the Level Design podcast. Yes, thank you very much. Always support indie developers, that's a, that's a default. Yes, I agree, <laughs> please do. Yeah, please do. We are working really hard to create small games, but it requires a huge amount of work. Yeah. It is. It's always a huge amount of work. And it's something it never ends. Often don't it never ends. <laughs> we should have a podcast about that. Like, what actually does it take to make a game? Uh, the amount yes. of money it takes. Uh, that, that would scare a lot of people away. Yeah. I think well, that might be um, a nice, like, um, I don't know, people who are wondering what, what game development is can, can actually see what is like, like the amount of time it will take you to make, like, I don't know, something small that is missed by a lot of people in while we play the game. That would be a very interesting thing to do. I, I think we can start with the anxiety issue. <laughs> so first of all, part one, stress. Stress. Yeah, uh, it's your best friend. Uh, yeah, so you either enemies with stress or you're friends with stress. And uh, the more you work in game development, you have to become friends and, and you know how to manage it. I think it's a whole other chat though. It's not, uh, yeah, I'll stop here. <laughs> yes, please, please. People are getting desperate and let's not scare them too much. I mean, we want it to be inclusive, not just, you know, uh, let, let's target say, the super hardcore, uh, the hardcore who... Uh, let, let's say it's not easy. It, yeah, it's it, not. And it contains a lot of risk. Yeah. Mm. Mm -hmm. That's why I suggest people also try doing something, you know, in pen and paper form, which is much simpler. The, you know, the experience is often comparable. And it's less technical. You can you, you talk can about try. board games. Yes, like board games, game. small RPGs, those sort of things that might you know work wonderfully. And the the, the rules and game design behind that is transferable to like absolutely any game yes, you make. Absolutely. So that's another thing that you can do if you want to start in in game design. Start with board games and then jump into engines. It mm -hmm. makes sense. I agree. Easy. So yeah. let's yeah. let's call it an eye. And yes. once again, thank you both. Thank you, Valentina. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks. Bye, everybody. So, bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you so much.